I'd now like to introduce Kavita Prakashmani to you. She's a fellow trustee of the Resource Centre and she's going to manage the question session. Kavita, over to you. And since we have till 8 o'clock? Between 4 to 2 and 8 o'clock, if people want to get up. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a bit daunting to stand here with a lot of expertise and knowledge, so I'm going to not even pretend to know any of the answers. I have probably as many questions as all of you have. So I'm just going to be a traffic warden, get questions from you, and direct them to the panel here. Uh, what we do need everyone to do is to come up to the mic. Are we using this one? We need people to come up to the mic because we are recording this for a global audience, and it's going to be on the Resource Center website. Um, it's that mic over there, which we may need to move forward a little. Um, yeah. And so because this is a legal discussion, I have been asked to make sure that you recognize that this will be recorded and that we assume that you give us permission to record you by coming up to the microphone and making a comment or a question. Um, what I'm going to ask people to do is, because we, have, we, do have, uh, we are short on time, we have about uh, half an hour, is to be short. Please introduce yourself, say who you are, where you're from, make a short comment or ask a question, and if it's directed to anyone, particular to Martin or Paul, then please say that as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chip Pitts from Stanford Law School, where I teach these issues. I'm very interested to hear the uh, speakers address uh, the talisman decision and the standard, and. Uh, specifically, if you, as I assume you do, agree that it's wrong, why is it wrong? Could you give us your perspective on uh, how it's wrong as a matter of international law? I guess that's machine. I guess that's me. <laughs> um, well, the the reason that it's wrong, I think, is that the um, there's no purpose requirement in international law, um, and that's the ICTY jurisprudence which is based on customary law, has a knowledge requirement. Um, and actually, in, the, in, in support of the petition that we filed to have a rehearing in the case, um, we had David Sheffer, Ambassador Sheffer, who was the lead negotiator for the Rome Treaty for the United States, um, submit something to the court saying that the court had gotten the Rome Treaty entirely wrong and that there was no intention to have a specific intent requirement in customary law, and the, the court would refuse to look at the brief. We also had Holocaust scholars who, who filed a brief that said that the Nuremberg standard was knowledge, not purpose or specific intent, and the court rejected that brief too. So it's fairly clear that the court was not interested in knowing <laughs> what, what international law really was. Um, and I think, if I can just say one additional word, I think that what, it was really an ideological decision in the sense that um, throughout the decision you had the sense that they were, they didn't like the idea of suing corporations under international human rights law. I mean, they said, for example, at one point in the decision that um, what the government of Sudan was doing was a land use decision. And of course, our argument was that you know most times you don't enforce land use decisions with helicopter gunships. Um, but and and they said that our case was a disguised effort uh, to prevent investment in Sudan, which is not something that we ever said. That's something that we ever argued. And so you had a sense that the members of the court, you know, had a position that they did not want these kind of cases to go forward and wanted to squeeze them out. Um, so I think that's, that's how I read it. Just a, an interesting point in principle is that it, uh, what's very peculiar really is that in the UK we have none of these issues about jurisdiction anymore, virtually none. We have not had a jurisdictional argument in terms of being able to bring the case in the UK since the Cape case which uh, was all about jurisdiction went up to the House of Lords. Uh, back in 2000 or so. And the reason for that is that the European uh, Commission at the time uh, brought out a change of rules that meant that you could basically bring a case against a particular multinational that is based in the UK as a matter of right. Um, and so since that uh, change got brought about, there's been absolutely uh, no issue for us on jurisdiction. So it's interesting just that the stroke of a, uh, a pen by somebody in uh, Europe um, the change has been brought about. Thank you. 
Lucy Amos from the International Business Leaders Forum. Uh, in light of the uh, framework issued by John Ruggie in 2008, the Protect Respect Remedy Framework, in which, amongst other things, he calls, urges, uh, urges companies to adopt due diligence, to have a human rights policy, to conduct an impact assessment, to implement and integrate the results of that imp uh, impact assessment within the company, and to track performance. Whilst I appreciate that that's still soft law and is, to the best of my knowledge, not yet integrated into the national legal system of any individual country, can you conceive of a situation where that can be, the, the framework itself and the, the demand for due diligence could be used to, as a measure to hold companies to account? So, for example, if they fail to have a, a, a policy and fail to conduct an impact assessment, could that be used as a measure of their complicity in, in a case where um, negligence or was, was being alleged. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Since Martin, you mentioned Ruggy, you can have a go first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, uh, I think it's a good point. Uh, I think undoubtedly the answer is yes, is that quite a lot of the cases that we're involved in are to do with the extraction industries, mining, oil, whatever. And I think that uh, if one was able to show that the company in uh, preparing its plans didn't uh, commit the due diligence it was supposed to, I think that would be a very powerful tool, uh, tool in the courts, yeah. In, in the U.S. context, it'll depend on what the test is. Um, if the test is knowledge and substantial assistance, then I think this would be very relevant testimony. Um, on the other hand, if, it, if, it, if you have to show purpose at a certain level, then who cares? It doesn't really matter unless the, they could be negligent in their due diligence and then it's not going to matter to the courts. So I think a, a lot depends on what the test is going to be. Thank you. Sarah Joseph, Caston Centre for Human Rights Law from Monash University in Melbourne. Um, I've got one question for Paul and one question for Martin. Um, for Paul, it's really just a tactical issue. You said that you might be um, appealing the Talisman case to the Supreme Court. I was just asking, is that really a good idea? <laughs> because you might end up with a precedent that applies across all of America, and you could end up uh, with the Supreme Court getting rid of corporate accountability under Alien Tort Claims Act altogether. Um, and for Martin, um, the Australian legal system is pretty similar to the British legal system, and the problem we've often got, uh, we, we haven't had many corporate accountability cases, just one that I know of, but in public inter interest litigation generally, um, in particular between environmentalists up against um, co companies, uh, companies have used this tactic of demanding security for costs, which often the plaintiffs, um, even, even with, you know, um, lawyers willing to work for free or um, they can't they can't assure that they'll pay, be able to pay the costs of the plaintiff and that can sometimes wipe out the litigation and is that a problem here in Britain? Okay. Um, would we like to be in front of the US Supreme Court? Not particularly. Um, but I argued this Sosa versus Alvarez Machine case in the Supreme Court in 2004 and that was a time when everybody thought that we would lose the entire alien tort statute, and yet six members of the court decided that you could use the statute for human rights cases, and we survived. Um, the truth is that it's going to depend on what Justice Kennedy thinks the law is, because he's the swing vote. There's four against us going in. There's probably four with us going in. Kennedy was with us in the Sosa case. Um, the Talisman case is probably as good factually as any case we're going to get. Um, and so it's not clear that waiting will help us. You know, I just think that it's clear the court's going to take a case fairly soon because there's a diversity of opinion between the circuits, and I think we're going to have to just take a chance. And the other problem, just from a, a lawyerly perspective, is that we have clients that that lost and and shouldn't have lost and and want justice and so you know whether we think it's a good idea for the human rights movement or not they need to be represented and so you know i think we we really don't have much of a choice on the issue of uh, security for cost just so that people